this is my last thing, relative risks. So that's the last thing, how to mislead the public. And the solution is absolute risk. So here's an example. Uh, in the UK, there's all, every few weeks, no, 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 weeks, sorry, every few years, there's a contraceptive pill scare. And the, the famous one from 1995 went in the following way. The media reported that women who take the third generation pill increase their risk of a thrombosis by 100%. That's certain, isn't it? Or it can't be more. <laughs> Many British women uh, reacted with panic, dropped the pill, which led to unwanted pregnancies and abortions. What <coughs> did the news show? Uh, what did the study shows on which the news was based? They showed that out of every 7,000 British women who took the previous generation pill, the second, one had a thrombosis, and out of every 7,000 who took the new generation pill, it was two. So from one to two is 100%. That's called a relative risk. But it's also one in 7,000. That's called an absolute risk. <coughs> the distinction between relative and absolute risk is still not clear to the public, whether in the US or in Germany or in Great Britain. Right? So we teach children in the school all kind of things that are of little use later in math, for instance, yeah. geometry, trigonometry. Yeah? That's nice, but important things are not being taught. <laughs> what did this single news show? And here you see, uh, before, uh, the uh, news, uh, there were in England and Wales a steady decrease of abortions. Then there was one news, in, within the next year there were 13,000 <coughs> abortions, then more than before, and more important, it went on. Women lost the trust in the pill. It was an emotional reaction. And nobody told them yeah, that they are being misled by a journalist who wanted to get the story on the first page. Nobody would have cared if the increase would be from one to two in 7,000. Uh, the point is, these uh, contraceptive pill scares, they happen again and again in the UK. And also the medical journals already, not always, uh, report the effects in relative risk increases. Eh? So the same sensor isolationism is there, and it figures better than one in 7,000. So it starts there. Uh, that's an uh, illustration from the um, US Libby tour. Uh, excuse me. Uh, what you see here is uh, Libby tour reduced the risk of stroke by 40 <coughs> Percent, that sounds good, isn't it? Almost 50 percent. So you're basically safe. Well, half of you are safe. <laughs> and again, what's not being said, this is a relative risk increase. What the study will really show is that from 100 people in uh, this high risk uh, uh, group, yeah, without the lipitor, 2.8 yeah, got a stroke. And Otherwise, it's reduced to 1.5. So it's 1.3 percentage points. Huh? But <clears throat> these things are not understood well. This is an ex example for breast cancer screening, exactly as we had before. Here you see what we know about uh, the two groups. No screening, one dose screening. Total cancer mortality is again the same. There's no... no uh, Evidence that a single life is being saved. <coughs> Breast cancer mortality decreases from 5 to 4. This is reported as 20% here. Yeah, Sometimes up to 30%. And, uh, and we have a similar number of false positives and uh, unnecessary treatments. Um, the Harding Center has worked with the which is authorities in Germany who disseminate misleading information. And one is the Deutsche Krebshilfe, the, uh, which has uh, disseminated uh, 
the typical type of inflammation of all cancers, overstating the benefits and understating the risk. And you, you know now how you do this, full with well, five-year survival rates and relative risk, so on. And the, if any numbers were given for the harms, then they are in absolute risk reduction because they look small. And uh, I've given many talks to medical societies on this issue and explained to the doctors one of the reasons why you don't understand this is not in your head. It is because of this type of brochures being misled. And the good thing is that the um, uh, that made its round to the Deutsche Krebshilfe and uh, the Deutsche Krebshilfe uh, I thought I had power, but can anyone do something about it? Otherwise, we just ignore it. Yeah? Uh, <coughs> the press speaker was uh, in Berlin, came and asked me whether I have anything against the Deutsche Krebs. I said, no, on the contrary, uh, we offer you to help you to revise your brochures, to write them in an all <coughs> scientific, evidence based way and understandable, and now there's a new generation up there. Final thing, what do you see? Do gynecologists understand what a 25% uh, risk reduction is? And this was also a group I had. What do you see? Uh, two thirds understand it. That's one out of a thousand. Yeah? But there is another third who think it's 25 out of a thousand. This may be a kind of calculation error. There are 250 out of a thousand. So even those experts, the large numbers, who do not understand the basic benefit information. The deception begins in medical journals, not just with the doctors and the press. And here are two facts. One trick is report benefits in big numbers and harms in small ones. And a study for the British Medical Journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the Lancet top journals shows that Mismatch framing. This is what we call mismatch framing. Yeah? You report the benefits and the harms in different currencies. Occurs in <coughs> one out of three articles. I've just written an editorial for the BMJ. And I must also say the BMJ reacted wonderfully. When I said this in public, the BMJ invited me to, to write a, uh, an editorial. No American journal invited me. The BMJ is a good one. And my suggestion was we did a little reanalysis. It's still happening there. And my suggestion was is that the editors are responsible <coughs> to stop yeah, this misinformation of the public and also the doctors. And that one should uh, give them two years' time. And if it's not being stopped, then the institutions who subscribe to the journals should stop the canceling the subscriptions. That's one way. I mean, whether they believe it, it will happen, doesn't matter. The important is they do it. Yeah? The second trick is report neither benefits and how in a transparent way. That's also often done. So, this is what I talked about. Yeah? These are just three <coughs> of many ways to uh, mislead the public. No uh, five year survival rates in product screening, mortality rates, no conditional probability, natural treatment, and absolute risk. That's clear. And uh, I'll give you at the end, a, a larger picture. I have been uh, doing a uh, book with uh, Sir Uwe Gray, who is at the moment uh, has his hands on reshaping the British health system. He thinks it's a great opportunity because the financial crisis wiped out the money, and finally we can do good health for less money. <coughs> That's possible. Yeah? And if we just get a century for the patient, the last century was for industry, doctors, and others. Yeah? And, and this is my picture now. Yeah? There are certainly things, there are patients are humans like us, yeah? and they have their own kind of maybe sometimes crazy thinking. But I believe the constant pointing yeah, to John Coop Public as the source of every error just misses the big picture. It starts in health, biased funding of research. We are putting so much money in medication, new medication, me too drugs, that need not be shown to be better than what exists. And 
that's just one. And in safety, patient research, very really little is being done. Okay. And if it's done. Uh, we need to end right now if you want time for questions. Okay. <laughs> then here's the last picture. <laughs> that was what we're talking about. You got the station for the vision of the health statistics, and this problem has a solution. Thank you for your.